Thank you for joining us today for our virtual community meeting. My name is Perry Dugard Owens and our team is happy to assist TDOT today in hosting this meeting. Today you will learn more about the study happening along the entire I-40 corridor as well as the I-81 corridor. Our agenda is to start with a brief introduction from TDOT, then a 25 minute presentation followed by a question and answer session. You may be aware that TDOT has already held round one in-person public meetings in Kingsport, Blountville, Knoxville, and Memphis. Meetings were also planned for Nashville and Cookville. However, they were rescheduled twice due to the recent tornado disaster and now the virus pandemic. So we are excited to fin finally connect with you all. A few items of note before I introduce our next speaker and turn this over. You all have been muted upon arrival, but please be sure to mute your sound just to ensure we do not have any background noise. Some of you may have been hearing about interruptions to online meetings called Zoom bombing. To guard against disruptions, we are using Zoom webinar and have set it up so that audio from participants is muted and only one way screen sharing. A reminder that this meeting is being recorded to post through YouTube on the study website for those unable to attend this meeting live or if you have to leave early. If you do have questions, please enter the question in the question and answer box at the top of your screen and we will answer them in order during our Q&A segment at the end of the presentation. If you need to leave the meeting before submitting your question, or if we are unable to get to your question, you will receive a follow-up email with contact information and a link to our survey that allows you to ask general questions. If you are joining by phone, please go to our website at a later date to see the recorded video and survey link. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our host for the evening, evening Jonathan Russell with TDOT Region 3. Jonathan? Yes, thank you so much. So yeah, again, my name is Jonathan Russell and I work within the Office of Community Transportation, which is a small division within the Long Range Planning Division. And so I represent Region 3, which is 26 counties in the Middle Tennessee area. Um, so just to let everyone know, in Tennessee, we do interstate studies of all of our interstates roughly every 10 years. And so right now it's time for the I-40 study, which actually wasn't last studied until uh, it was 2008. So it's been 12 years since we looked at our I-40. So we look at the whole corridor. We, we look from Memphis in the Southwest all the way to um, Northeast Tennessee and the Tri-Cities. Now, that being said, this is actually the I-40 and I-81 corridor study. I-40 goes Southeast when it leaves Knoxville and I-81 goes Northeast up into Virginia. So we're actually looking at both of those segments. So you might not be familiar with 81, but it is involved in this study. So the outcome of the study will basically be recommendations. And those recommendations are for projects on a 20 year horizon, some with short term, some midterm, some long term. So we're looking at, at road widenings, capacity improvements, truck climbing lanes in various parts of East Tennessee. Now the recommendations that come from this study will actually be used by TDOT and project selection. So if next year TDOT is planning, you know, what, what projects need to be done on I-40, they'll go back and look at this the study. I would ask though, if you have any questions at the end, please keep those questions strictly to issues relating to I-40. Now this study does not, you know, look at potholes. It doesn't look at little maintenance issues that can be done on individual basis. This is more large scale. So if you have any questions about potholes, about other issues and maybe the downtown Nashville area that might not directly relate to I-40. My contact information is gonna be in the chat. So feel free to reach out to me through email or phone anytime. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to WSP. You're gonna be speaking, you're gonna be hearing from Gene Stevens. Uh, TDOT is not directly doing the study. We have a consultant. So Gene, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I appreciate it. Okay, thanks Jonathan and thanks everybody for joining us today. We're very excited. This is the first public meeting that TDOT has held by, by webinar. And as Perry said, we have tried twice to hold these meetings and nature just wasn't cooperating with us. So it is our pleasure to come tonight to you digitally. Um, I have made sure that my neighbor finished mowing his lawn and I think the trash truck has already come. So hopefully you won't hear any disruptions in the background, but my team will let me know if we have any audio problems. Uh, hopefully everything will go smoothly. 
Um, as Jonathan said, I've got the pleasure of leading this team for TDOT's I-4081 corridor study. The things that we're going to talk about today generally are what is the study for, which I think Jonathan has partially covered. What are the steps in the study? We want to talk to you a little bit about conditions um, based on what we've seen in our analysis of the data so far. However, we recognize that data doesn't always show everything. And that's why we're holding this round of public meetings so that we can ask citizens and business owners to provide comments on the corridor and what's going on. Um, as Perry said, we'll be responding to questions toward the end of the presentation. And we'll also show you a link on the screen at the end where you can complete an online survey on TDOT's website. Uh, since you registered for this webinar, you'll also get a follow-up email and that email will have the survey link in it. So you will not be able to escape this survey. We really want you to take it. As Jonathan mentioned, TDOT has previously done a corridor study for I-4081. Uh, it covers a 20-year time frame, so we'll be updating that. Although it is a long range in terms of being a 20-year study, we are going to phase recommendations, so that includes both short and midterm improvements as well. Um, it's a data-driven planning process to identify not only current interstate needs, but also what we anticipate would be needed in the future with input from people like you who live and work along the corridor and use it for your travels. And as Jonathan mentioned, the study's purpose is to result in a pool of projects that decision makers can consider as funding becomes available. This is by far the longest interstate corridor in Tennessee, as Jonathan mentioned. It totals about 530 miles when you add I-40 and I-81 together. It spans the entire state from the Arkansas state line to the Virginia state line in Bristol. And also when you look at the map, there is a short section of I-40 where my mouse is that goes from the junction with 81 down to the North Carolina state line. So it passes through a total of 28 counties and connects eight of the state's 11 metropolitan areas. So it's clearly got a lot of influence and a lot of needs. And as you heard, this evening's meeting, we're going to focus on the portion of the interstate that's located within TDOT's Region 3, which runs from the Tennessee River on the west to the Wilson-Smith County line on the east. So that's the area that we'll be focusing on in our slides. However, as Jonathan mentioned, we know that at least some of you use the corridor for longer trips. So we definitely welcome comments from you on other segments if you have some comments. We are deep into the first stage of this study, looking at current deficiencies on I-40 and I-81, what an additional needs we can anticipate in the next 20 years, and also where there may be opportunities to improve access and travel. In the next stage, we're going to develop a list of potential solutions, and TDOT has asked us to organize these possible solutions into these five categories, um, highway expansion and improvement, transportation systems management and operations, which we'll talk about more in a minute, safety, freight and goods movement, and transit and travel demand management. So once we have developed those, these potential projects and programs, we will evaluate them according to how well they help TDOTs meet its goals for mobility, safety, and supporting state and regional economies. And then finally, the projects that best meet those goals will be prioritized into a 20-year set of recommendations. So those are the steps we're following. This slide shows the project stages in relation to public engagement. As mentioned, we are starting here, we're at existing and future conditions stage, and we've been holding a number of public meetings across the corridor. Our last formal meeting is scheduled this Thursday, and we'll be hosting it for the Cookville-Crossville region. Uh, following this first round of public meetings, we're going to continue to invite public comment using the online survey on TDOT's website, and we'll have a second round of public meetings later this year to discuss the final recommendations for the corridor. So that survey will stay open, please use it. Now we wanted to go ahead and show you an overview of the types of issues that we're evaluating for the corridor. And as you see here, they're generally reflecting the same categories that I showed you a minute ago that TDOT has asked us to use to organize potential projects and programs that would be recommended. Uh, Jonathan mentioned that TDOT has already completed an I-4081 corridor study and that it's being updated now. Some of the recommendations from that study have already been implemented. They're shown here in orange. The majority of these are locations where truck climbing lanes were constructed, uh, primarily to benefit travel in less populated areas where there might only be two lanes of interstate, um, but it's you know, a sustained long grade where a truck could slow other traffic down quite a bit if there was not a place for the truck to move over and, and for others to pass. So that's what you see in orange. The other projects that are shown here in red are those that are currently in some stage of development. And as you can see, there's a lot happening in this region, uh, including projects that are funded through the additional fuel tax revenues that were collected since the IMPROVE Act was passed. 
for example, you see there are two I-40 widening projects in Wilson County. There's another one proposed in West Nashville, the Bellevue area. Uh, and you'll notice that while most of the improvements here are directly on I-40-81, we're also showing some road projects that have a direct traffic impact on the interstate, not the interstate itself, but a direct traffic impact to it. Uh, for example, there are projects to widen portions of Central Pike on the east side of Nashville, as well as Charlotte Pike on the west side of Nashville. And both of these highways serve the same east-west travel patterns as I-40, so it's important to take note of them as we're looking at interstate needs. The large project that you see shown here in the light red shading is TDOT's I-24 Smart Corridor project. This one is of interest not just because it feeds traffic in and out of uh, I-40, which is what we're studying, but because of the nature of the project. The state's piloting an integrated corridor management approach, ICM, to improve travel quality between Davidson and Rutherford counties, which as many of you know is, is one of the most congested corridors of the region. We mention it tonight because some of the concepts are likely to be considered in TDOT's other interstate planning efforts. What's going on with this project is the smart corridor will make improvements not only to I-24, but also to Murfreesboro Road, the state highway that runs parallel to I-24. They're looking at technology to improve signal timing, and also manage some of the I-24 interchanges to meter, ramp metering if you've heard of that, to meter the amount of traffic that's allowed to merge onto the interstate at a given time so as not to create unnecessary slowdowns for through traffic. This is also multimodal. Uh, buses may be allowed to use the interstate shoulder during peak times, and in that way, transit riders can avoid congestion delays. So if they're making a connection at the end of their trip, their schedule is a little more reliable. So this is very exciting stuff. Um, and I, as I mentioned, I think some of the same things could be expected in some of TDOT's other interstate planning efforts. And I'll give a little plug. If you're interested in more details on that project, you can Google TDOT I-24 Smart Corridor. They've got lots of details. Okay, in addition to the projects that are currently underway, we are taking note in our study of other planning activities that are ongoing in the I-4081 corridor. Uh, some of what you see here in the yellow diamonds are safety studies that TDOT has been conducting at a number of interchanges. Primarily, these are looking at interchanges where traffic may be backing up on the ramps. So we're making sure that we're aware of those recommendations and they can be incorporated into this larger study. Uh, the other thing to point out is that the portions of the I-40 corridor that are located in Davidson, Williamson, and Wilson counties are also part of the regional transportation plan that's developed and maintained by GNRC which is the Greater Nashville Regional Council. Many of the projects in their regional plan that directly impact the I-40 corridor were actually shown on the previous slide as projects underway. Uh, other projects that are not underway but are in that regional long-range plan are shown here in green. So you'll notice in particular, there's a lo proposed long-term widening of I-40 in East Wilson County, going all the way out to the Linwood Road exit beyond 840. Now, Traffic flow is a topic where we have much better data than we used to as planners for using in transportation analysis. Uh, there is a federal database available that TDOT has access to, to actual travel time information, which is assembled through all the things that we report to Google, our cell phones, our in-vehicle navigation systems, all the things that, that are beeping while we're driving around tracking us. This information has all been collected anonymously and put together in a database that we can use just like this. What you see here in the color coding is excess hours traveled. Essentially, that's how much more time people spent on certain sections of the interstate last year compared to travel times that would be expected during non-congested conditions. Now, I know nobody on this webinar is shocked to see that the most dramatic slowdowns are in the core of Nashville. Uh, however, on a statewide basis, when you're looking across Tennessee, this is a really valuable screening tool to help us zero in on the hotspots to be studied. Now, just because an area is shown as green and you know that you experience congestion on it, uh, this is not to say that there isn't congestion happening on other portions of I-40. But outside of the Davidson and Wilson County areas, some of those slowdowns may often be related more to non-recurring events such as wrecks. And also, as I said at the beginning, we know that data doesn't always capture everything. So again, please stay tuned for that link to the online survey and provide us with some of these comments and concerns. In terms of safety, the team has been looking at the five most recent available years of crash data, and we are focusing in particular on crash types that tend to create the most serious disruption to interstate traffic. Clearly, any time a truck is involved in a crash, you might very well have at least a lane shut down, if not the entire uh, east or westbound uh, lanes. 
Uh, median crossovers often result in head-ons. Roadway departures are quite often fatal when they're on high-speed facilities. So we're going to focus in particular on those. In terms of how we're going to use this information, within a 530-mile corridor, this obviously can't be a detailed crash-by-crash -crash analysis. The purpose is to conduct a high-level screening, identify where there are hot spots that TDOT may then want to investigate further. And again, I can't say this enough, part of our purpose tonight is to urge you to give us input on not only the types of safety issues that concern you on I-4081, but also specific locations if there are some. Please include those on the survey. Let's talk about operations and management. And you saw this earlier as one of the types of solutions that TDOT had asked us to look at. How do you do system management and operations? Some of this actually is exemplified in that I-24 Smart Corridor project I talked about a few minutes ago. Um, many of you may know that up to 60% of highway congestion is non-recurring, meaning that it happens because of incidents like wrecks, weather, special events like football games. Um, so investing more in enhanced operations and management can sometimes be a cost-effective alternative to highway expansion, which is important in a state like Tennessee where we do not borrow in order to do roads. We, we don't, we pay as you go. TDOT has put a lot over the last decade into its SmartWay program, which many of you may be aware of either through using it on your phones or maybe calling the 511 system. Uh, the SmartWay right now is focused mostly in major urban areas. As some of you know, there are radar detectors on the side of the road that help TDOT monitor average speeds on different road segments, not because anybody's going to give you a ticket, but so that you can have that handy color-coded map when you pull it up on Waze on your cell phone and you can see that this section of interstate's red, so you want to make sure you take a different route. Well, that information is brought to you courtesy of TDOT SmartWay. It also includes cameras, and the purpose of those is not only to impress you with the amount of traffic that's backed up in a particular location, but it helps detect incidents. And when incidents happen, they give it TDOT the opportunity to look at what's going on on that section of roadway so that they know what kind of equipment they need to send out to respond. You know, if a truck has turned over with rolls of toilet paper, they probably better send the police because there's going to be a riot. Uh, the other thing in urban areas that has been incredibly helpful, and it was one of the first things rolled out, is the help truck patrols. And as many of you know, those are operating fairly close in to the Nashville region. They don't go out too far, but they definitely patrol the most heavily used sections of interstate. And their primary function is to keep the roads clear of incidents. So if somebody's got a flat tire, they help them get safely off the road, get the tire changed, and get them back on the road. If there's a wreck, they handle traffic management until law enforcement can get there. So these are relatively inexpensive things to do uh, compared to adding a lane for several miles on the interstate, and they help traffic flow more smoothly. A lot of that, again, addresses the non-recurring congestion. In terms of what can be done for recurring congestion, uh, there are some strategies that help maximize traffic operations on the interstate. Examples would be truck climbing lanes, as we just discussed. You don't need to add a full lane throughout Tennessee. You add it in areas where trucks are really struggling to get up the hills. Uh, in the urban areas, there are lanes reserved for high occupancy vehicles with the idea of providing an incentive for people to make the same number of trips in fewer cars. So the idea is let's manage traffic and try to incentivize people to travel in ways that um, reduce traffic flow, maybe spread the peak out if we have staggered work shifts, things like that. I put this slide in to show you that there is actually quite a bit of SmartWay expansion planned. Uh, what you see here in orange are planned expansions of SmartWay both east and west of Nashville. On I-40 west of Nashville, it will be extended from uh, the Bellevue exit all the way out to I-840 in Dixon County. On the east side, you see that we're expecting it to be expanded from exit 216 at Donaldson Lake all the way out to Lebanon. So that will be a, an extended amount of coverage. Also want to point out, and of course I, I mentioned the I-24 corridor, that's why that's highlighted. There are a couple of local projects I wanted to point out as well. They're not part of officially TDOT SmartWay system, but they will definitely help with uh, parallel routes and intersecting routes on the interstate, and they're being done locally. Uh, Mount Juliet, the city is doing signal coordination on Mount Juliet Road. That's a very active interchange on us. And also out in Lebanon, Lebanon is going to be creating its own SmartWay system and a traffic management center similar to a, you know, a, a miniature version of what TDOT does to monitor speeds and receive video camera feed and dispatch. So these are, are great ways to um, tackle highway congestion without necessarily spending a lot of money. 
This plan will certainly include freight. Uh, TDOT recently completed a statewide freight plan, so we'll be incorporating the issues and needs that it identified. And you see here that in this region, freight is multimodal. Um, clearly, I-40 and I-81 are some of the most important tra tra ugh, travel and trucking corridors. I-40 is east-west across the whole country. And when you follow I-81, you go all the way up the uh, Atlantic coast, all the way into Canada. So there are a lot of through trips coming through the Nashville region using I-40. In addition, we are a rail heavy region. Uh, although there's not a lot of freight rail going directly east-west, we have a fairly healthy system of rail operated by CSX in the region. And we have an inland waterway, the Cumberland River, which is used for barge traffic. And there are three private ports uh, that facilitate that, that need to be looked at. Um, and then the, finally, there's air cargo, which with e-commerce and more time-sensitive shipping going on is going to be increasingly important. So we will be looking at the key supply chains that are using I-40 and I-81 and how these facilities uh, are facilitating or impeding some of that travel. For a, the scale of this corridor, a 530-mile corridor dictates a fairly high-level approach to studying transit needs and solutions. Uh, primarily, what we will be looking at is intercity services. I'm talking between all the major cities in Tennessee, from Bristol all the way to Memphis. Uh, what you see here is that actually the Region 3, especially the Nashville region, is quite well served with local fixed route transit service. And I, I know that GNRC and others are making efforts to try to tie those more closely together. Uh, so what we would be looking at then is how to tie, for instance, Knoxville and Nashville or Knoxville and Memphis, because services like Megabus currently operate, they stop in Memphis and Nashville, but they don't necessarily operate between cities. Outside of the urban areas, too, I want to note, as some of you may know, that many of the rural counties are also served um, with transit by the local human resources agencies. Um, they provide door-to-door appointment-based service for folks that live outside urban areas. So again, this is something that we are welcoming your comments on, your comments and thoughts. And then finally, there are several agencies in this area that operate carpool and vanpool programs. So those who are traveling on I-40 every day in a busy part of the corridor have the opportunity to um, hook up with others who are making the same trip. So maybe you don't always have to be the person to drive. All right, as we wrap up the presentation portion of the webinar, I do again want to emphasize that if you do nothing else, we really want you to complete the online survey and share your thoughts and concerns about I-40 and 81. Um, there are a lot of questions with multiple choice, but there are also several places where there are open-ended boxes where you can type in comments, and we, we absolutely welcome that, um, particularly if there are specific locations where you want to draw something to our attention. Uh, another thing that Perry mentioned, but I want to mention again in case you arrived late to the webinar, is that you're going to be able to find a copy of this full slide presentation on TDOT's project website for the study, which is listed here. And uh, in the next day or so, when you visit that page, not only will you see a PDF with all the slides, but there will be a link to the recording version of this webinar, and that, will be, that link will take you to YouTube. So we're trying very hard. If you had friends or family or know of somebody later that may say, oh, I really wish I'd known about that, they can experience the same thing you did in recorded version. So we want to be sure that's, that's out there and that you can help us spread that word. Uh, we could not figure out a way to make the SurveyMonkey link live. Uh, so if you don't want to copy it down or copy and paste it right now, I do want to remind you that if, since you registered for the webinar, you're automatically going to get a follow-up email that gives you this link. Uh, in some cases, I think the email appears right away, but it may take a few hours. Uh, but either way, you'll get it and you'll be able to take the survey. So at this point, I think Perry mentioned that we're going to take some questions and we may not be able to answer all of them today. Uh, so we will, if we don't get to your question today, bec again, because you registered for the webinar, we will be able to see uh, who asked the question and we'll be able to follow up individually with you. So let's see. I know some of you have probably been typing in questions as we went. Uh, if you have not, and you have some questions based on what you've seen, please go ahead and take the opportunity right now to type those in. And while some of you are doing that, I'll take a look at the questions that we've gotten so far. Okay, here's a good one. Someone's asking, where can I get more information about 
some of the projects that are underway. Okay, there's at least a couple of options. One is, I mentioned earlier that you can Google uh, for the I-24 Smart Corridor project. There is another Google search you can do that will pull up information on projects statewide. What you can Google is TDOT Spot, like Spot the Dog. Uh, that stands for, I forget what, Statewide Project Tracker, I think. That is an interactive statewide map of projects. And the majority of what I have uh, shown in the slides today will be on that website. A second option would be to reach out to Region 3's TDOT Planning Supervisor, Jonathan Russell. He introduced himself earlier. Uh, let's see. Here's another one. Why are trucks going through downtown Nashville instead of using 840 or Briley Parkway? Okay. Some are using 840 or Briley Parkway, but as many of you have noticed, it's not necessarily a large number of trucks. Uh, we have talked to the Tennessee Trucking Association in gathering information for this study. And part of what we're hearing is that a lot of truckers still rely on their GPS units. So if they're just coming through, um, they're looking and what they see is that the distance through downtown Nashville is several miles shorter than if they use 840. So to them, it looks like the more efficient route. Um, however, I have noticed, and you probably have too, that in the last few years, TDOT has installed message boards on either end where 840 leaves and joins the interstate that report what the current travel times are on 840 versus the travel times going through downtown. And I know part of that has been an effort to raise awareness among all drivers, really, not just trucks, if we have tourists coming through. And then I guess the other thing to remember is that some trucks are going through downtown Nashville because they need to make drop-offs or pickups in the area. So not everybody is a through truck. Sure, and Gene, this is Jonathan Russell again. Just to add to that, uh, TDOT was very well aware that a lot of truckers were not using 840. And that's largely due to the fact that 840 has been a state route. And as you know, in Tennessee, we have a lot of state routes. And so sometimes out-of-state truckers might think, well, it's state route 840. It probably has red lights and stop signs. So, and it doesn't because it was built to interstate specifications. And because it was built to those specifications, TDOT requested from the Federal Highway Administration and the truck and ASHTO, which is, which is an association, that it be renamed Interstate 840, which TDOT was granted that. So it's no longer State Route 840, it's Interstate 840, and we're still, that's kind of in the infancy stages, so we're still trying to get that information out. Great. Okay, I see a question here, can TDOT, please look at adding managed toll lanes on I-40 from 840 on the west side to 840 on the east side. Okay, uh, some of you, I don't know how many folks on the call have heard of managed lanes other than the high occupancy vehicle lanes that we mentioned earlier, the HOV. Uh, just in terms of explanation, some states have gone to allowing HOV vehicles to use the lane for free, but then also allowing during peak times other people who are driving alone to use the lane if they pay. So it's sort of a hybrid. It's not exactly a toll lane, but it's not an HOV lane either. Sometimes those are called HOT, high occupancy toll. And again, in, in some states that's being viewed as a, a way for uh, people to, to uh, pay a user fee for that extra um, reduction in travel time, that benefit that they would get. So that's certainly something that, that could be looked at. Right now, I don't believe Tennessee legislation allows it, but uh, you know, this is a 20 year study and, and times change, so that would be something that could be considered. Uh, another question. I understand I-40 has the most accidents of any interstate running through Tennessee. If true, how much of that activity occurs in region three? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I will admit I don't have at my fingertips whether it does have the most accidents of any interstate in Tennessee, but given that it's the longest interstate corridor, that definitely seems likely. Um, how much of that activity occurs in Region 3? Um, I would need to look at our statewide map. I guess what I've got right now is the region map in front of me to answer that question. But when you think about the crashes is sort of a function of exposure. 
So the more often I drive, the more likely I will be to have a crash. And so when you think about the size of the Nashville metropolitan area, um, clearly there's a, a lot of exposure to crashes. So when you combine the mileage with the number of people driving, just because it's such a busy metropolitan area, it would not be surprising to me that Region 3 would have the high number of crashes. Um, we have definitely identified a number of high crash areas in, in Region 3, th 3 through the high level screening that we've done. Um, we can look into that and um, provide a private answer to the person who asked. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, another question, will there be any widening of I-40 through Nashville? Um, th through the Nashville metropolitan region, for sure, uh, we showed a slide earlier that showed two widening projects in Wilson County, generally extending what's already been widened out past 840. Uh, and then also to the west, there is a section that's proposed to be widened between, um, I think it's Bellevue, I think I've got a cheat sheet here. Uh, from McCrory Lane to exit 196, which is Bellevue. Now, beyond that, it gets more challenging because, as you know, when you drive that area, uh, sometimes the right-of-way is very limited. Uh, so definitely one of the challenges in, in looking through the, the core part of Nashville is what can be done within the right-of-way or within a, a cost that Tennessee could afford. Uh, so and, good question. Jean, I would like to yeah. maybe if I could piggyback on that. So, yeah, as you mentioned, Gene, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on east of downtown Nashville, a lot of stuff going on west of downtown Nashville, and it is tricky. But I want to give credit right now to the Greater Nashville Regional Council. And I know, Gene, you mentioned that earlier. The Greater Nashville Regional Council is, is basically a cog. It's a council of government, but they, also, they are also the host of the Nashville Area MPO, which is a, a federally designated area, which any city over 50,000 people in the United States have. And currently, the GNRC is conducting an interloop study. Now, this is being done on their own accord. It is partially being funded by TDOT, of roughly 10%. But they are going to look at the whole entire interloop. So, you know, that, that talks about I-24 and I-65 and I-40. So, currently, there are no plans from TDOT to do anything with the inner core. But this study being done by the GNRC, and I encourage you all to go to their website. Um, that's something that TDOT is, is trying to work hand in hand with the GNRC on. So, you know, is there something being done right now? No, but this study is, is the first step in that. So we're, we're excited about that. Aha, uh -huh. I wasn't, I was muted and didn't realize it. Okay, I see one more good question here. With the coronavirus, will we see more people telecommuting and therefore less traffic? Uh, if you've got an answer to that, I would love to hear it. Uh, I think what we're, what we're talking about in the profession is we're definitely hearing some people say, hey, until I was forced to try this, I didn't realize that almost my entire office can work from home. Uh, and we're definitely hearing a lot of people say that they might continue that for their business. Um, but I would say that telework is a trend that transportation planners have been monitoring and taking into account for years. Uh, I think what may change dramatically is that we may see the trend accelerate as a result of the current situation. So definitely something to be taking into account was being taken into account, but maybe we need to be uh, considering that it could happen even faster than we had anticipated. The other thing that we're seeing from this crisis is that e-commerce, all of us ordering from Amazon and other online sources, that was already a really fast growing um, component of freight traffic. And I think we're definitely going to see as a result of this that people have also learned how much stuff they can get dropped off at their door. So it's quite likely that we're going to continue to see growth in truck traffic to support those deliveries. That's a great question. Okay, here's a question. In what ways is the plan tracking commercial and residential development along the corridor? TDOT uses a statewide travel demand model to help us project out to 2040 what traffic patterns are going to be like. And behind that model is a lot of forecasting that's been fed in, uh, in terms of population and employment in different areas along the interstate. Um, the forecasts that we're using are based on that travel demand model. Huh. 
ha ha. How soon? Okay, two people ask the same question, basically. What about autonomous vehicles? How soon do we predict self-driving vehicles to hit roads? And how is this expected to affect traffic? Wow. Yeah, that's another one that planners are really talking about right now in several states that I'm, I'm aware of. Um, I think what you have to consider and what we've been talking to folks in other states about at WSP is that self-driving is sort of the last stage. Right now, we're, we are starting in semi autonomous vehicles, you know, it's, it could almost be considered driver assist. And so your latest car may have lane keeping assistance. In other words, it nags you when you start drifting over the line one direction or the other. Uh, that in some sense is, is self-driving. It's just at a very, very minor scale. Uh, when you implement it all the way up to stage five, which is full, I'm going to sit in the back seat and watch Disney while this is going on. Um, that's remains to be seen how much of that traffic is going to hit the interstate. Um, some of it depends on long distance travel. A lot of, of uh, autonomous vehicle trips I suspect are going to be happening locally. I don't know if any other panelists want to chime in on that. There's a lot of different schools of thought right now. I think that's one reason it's good that this is a 20 year set of recommendations uh, because there is a chance, of course, that the study will be updated again before we have full implementation of autonomous vehicles. Uh, the other thing to consider that I've heard a lot about is how expensive they may be. And with what's happening to our economy, who knows how long it will take to bounce back. It may be a, a, a functionality that a lot of folks won't be able to afford quite as early as car manufacturers might have expected. Anything else, any other, anybody else wants to add to that? Yeah, this is Jonathan again from, from TDOT. You know, as Gene said, you know, we're not really sure what the end product of autonomous vehicle looks like right now. But our bridge design and our design division are, are already thinking about, are we leaving enough right away when we're putting bridges in? Uh, you know, just little things that we don't necessarily think of. You know, when TDOT buys right away, they typically buy what they need. And sometimes in the past, they'll buy a little bit more than, than needed, just in case there needs to be a widening in the future. But they don't really think about those placement of the columns and the pillars for, the, for bridges. So, TDOT is thinking about that, uh, but it's still something so new that we really don't have the answer to right now. But just to whoever answered, asked that question, it's a great question, and TDOT is definitely thinking about it. So, excellent question. I guess, Jonathan, TDOT also recently, or the state of Tennessee, adopted legislation in the last year or two to allow truck platooning. And for those of you who haven't heard of that, that's basically um, providing a, a, an electronic system whereby trucks can drive in a platoon, that's why they call it that, uh, and drive much more closely together between truck vehicles than what they would otherwise do. Uh, the lead truck sort of leads the way. It, it controls the speed at which everybody else travels. Uh, there are still drivers in the, the trucks that are part of the chain, but um, they have a chance to be less involved in the driving. and having the ability to have trucks running more closely together, as long as it's safe, really helps them with fuel efficiency because of the drafting effect. That's correct. Tennessee was the third state to, to make that legal. I don't know how much has been implemented yet because what we've seen is it's most efficient for long trips. And a lot of trucking in Tennessee, they're making stops in major urban areas to do pickups and drop offs. Okay, will there be any development of light rail along the corridor or stacked highways? Right now, I am not aware of any proposals. Um, Jonathan mentioned earlier that GNRC, the regional transportation entity, uh, they are conducting quite a bit of transit planning and development of light rail along this corridor would very likely be something that would be um, discussed and proposed in one of the plans that they'd conduct. Yeah, that's correct, Gene. When you look at development of a light rail, um, about eight years ago, TDOT was doing another corridor study, which was a 24 corridor study. And at the last minute, TDOT got a request to look at the possibility of adding light rail along the I-24 corridor from Nashville to Murfreesboro. And the simple finances of it is that it's extremely expensive. And something like that would probably need to be a locally led effort. Now, TDOT is always wants to be in the conversation as we're the Department of Transportation for the state. 
Um, that being said, that would take some very strong funding from federal grants, from potential in, you know, financial input from local municipalities, as well as Department of Transportation. So this study is a multimodal study, but we're not specifically looking at any type of light rail along the corridor at this moment. Not, not as part of this I-4081 study. These are great questions. And if any of you asking the questions have some thoughts or suggestions on them, definitely share those on the survey. You never know what an idea can spark. Okay. Well, to reiterate, uh, we are going to post these slides uh, on TDOT's website, the project website, which is shown here. Uh, we definitely want you to take the survey. And those of you who are members of social media accounts, we would love it if you would uh, spread that link to others. We have often find that social media is one of the best ways to communicate the surveys because people don't have to go to a computer and type in the link. All they have to do is click on what you sent. So if you know others who didn't make the webinar, uh, again, and our, our users of the interstate that you know would have an opinion, we urge you to share the link. Uh, and we really appreciate you spending the time with us this evening. Uh, where else were you going to go, right? No, seriously, we, we are very excited to have been able to conduct this uh, in this webinar format and really, really appreciate uh, you asking such good questions. And at this point, if we don't have any further questions, I'm going to turn this back over to Perry. Thanks, Jean, and thank you all again for joining us today for our virtual community meeting. We do hope that you learned more about the work happening along the entire I-40 corridor as well as the I-81 corridor. As already mentioned, but just a couple of reminders, you will receive a follow-up email with a link to our website and survey. It will also include access to a recording of this meeting. Please be sure to share the information regarding the study with your friends as it does cover the entire corridor, which spans across the entire state. TDOT has another web-based meeting for the TDOT Region 2 area, which is surrounding Cookville this Thursday. So we thank you again uh, so much for joining us and good night.